Welcome to Speaking of Grace, the weekly message podcast from the Whole Life Church in Orlando, Florida. We're a multi-ethnic, multicultural, and multi-generational congregation committed to our mission of loving people into a lifelong friendship with God. We are committed to our vision of being a church without walls, fully engaged in serving the people of our community. Thank you for joining us as we continue Speaking of Grace. How's everybody doing? New Year's off to a good start? Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. You do know I get the last word, right? I do know that. Okay, I'm just saying. Yeah. Let's see if we can fear that I know what to do. Look at that. There we are. Oh, thank you. It's my birthday. <laughs> you know, I need to do something. Um, Bernie, follow me. Bernie didn't know this was coming, by the way. I, I'm going to give you a microphone, and I'm praying that you're going to love me after this is all over, okay? Because <laughs> you're bigger than me. Um, why did you get up and follow me? Because you're my pastor, and I, uh, you asked me to. Wow, I, I like that answer. Um, uh, so, but we've known each other before. We have. So we have a little bit of trust with each other? We do. Okay. And so, did it feel a little uncomfortable? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Especially since you weren't expecting it. Yes, yeah. that's correct. But I want you to know there was also some method to what I'm doing. I wanted to advertise a little bit. Okay. Because you're wearing a shirt. Yeah. All right. If you don't know what that's all about, Bernie is one of our Adventure Club leaders, co-leaders. And there's a meeting this afternoon, right? There is, Okay. Yes. And so if you have kids that, what age range is this? So uh, we are, uh, it's supposed to be five to nine, but we are accepting four as well. Okay. Um, and Tamson Thomas is my co-director. So her and I are working very hard together. Um, you can contact Tamson or myself. Cool. So I just wanted to go ahead and highlight that for just a second, because they've got a great program that they're running there. Um, but I also wanted to kind of use you as a little bit of a metaphor. Um, we often think about Jesus calling these disciples, and we don't think about what it would have been like to be called out in front of your friends, your neighbors, and asked to leave everything behind. You had to, you had to leave your good-looking family over there and come onto this platform. Did, you know, did we talk about this beforehand? We did not. So you, <laughs> so you had no idea what was about to happen. I did not. You did not. <laughs> and that can feel a little bit concerning. It can, yes. But you answered the invitation. I did. Are you hoping I'm done? A little bit. <laughs> I am done. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you, man. You know, we got a really cool theme this year. It's called Follow Me, but it's not just a cool theme. For me, it's much more than that. And I want to dive into that during our sermon today with you. This idea of following me, to me, is a core gospel foundation. And so this year, we're really going to spend some time talking about what it means to follow Jesus. But I want you to remember, it always starts with an invitation and a decision. And that's what we're talking about during the sermon today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, be here with us. You promised that where two or three are gathered in your name, that you'd be there. And we definitely have two or three here. So we know you're here. We ask that you would help those who are listening to hear what you have to say. And Lord, as I speak, I pray that you would say through me what you want to be heard. I pray in your name. Amen. 
So we have a theme text for this entire year. The, the entire year, 2023, our theme is follow me. And our theme text for this year comes to us from the book of Mark, chapter 1, verse 17. I am not going to, uh, you know, hide from you the fact that Mark is my favorite gospel author. I like him. Um, as somebody who used to work in news, he and I have the same news approach. You know, the book of Mark is right to the point. No extra. Let's just let's get, tell the story and let's keep going. And I love that about Mark. And so what I want to do is kind of catch you up with what's happening in Mark chapter 1, verse 17, because it's really important that when we read the Bible, we don't just look at the verse that we're going to one verse, but we look at what's happening around it so that we can pick up the context of what's going on. So let's go ahead and take a look at the context of what's happening in the book of Mark chapter 1. I'm going to go ahead and paraphrase the first little bit of it, okay? So the first little bit of it is basically that, that Mark says, now there's this guy named John. He wasn't the Messiah, but he came and he came to prepare the way for the Messiah. Now, Jesus, who is the Messiah, comes and is baptized by John. Jesus goes out in the wilderness and is tempted. And then we get to this next verse. This next verse says, now, after John was taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, by the way, preaching that message that we just heard, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. This is our theme text for the year. Verse 7, Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once. And followed him. A little further up the shore, Jesus saw Zebedee's sons, James and John, in a boat repairing their nets. He called them, and he called them at once, and they also followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. As courageous as Bernie was to come up front, imagine the courage it took to leave behind your profession and follow a homeless man. Because that's the way Jesus described himself. Jesus said that foxes have dens, but I don't have a home. I don't have a place to lay my head. That's the man that called these people. We sometimes forget that. But they left it. They followed. So we're going to be on a journey this year. And so what I would want you to not do is to get caught up on knowing everything in one sermon. Okay? So let's just understand, I'm going to talk about following Jesus, and some of you are going to get done with this sermon and go, but I don't know how, I mean, how would I know if Jesus actually called me? Don't worry about it. We're going to get there. But we got to start at the beginning, just accepting the invitation, knowing what to look for. So let's go ahead and dive into that. I want to suggest to you that when Jesus calls these disciples, there are three elements to this invitation that are really important to understand that I want you to dig into. So the first element is found right here in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 uh, and 15, I do believe. The, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. A lot of times when we talk about the call of Jesus to these disciples, we only talk about Jesus walking along the lake shore, and then we say that Jesus called them. But this is what comes immediately before. Jesus is walking around this lake saying this, and this is the call that these disciples respond to. They were, they were called to come follow Jesus, but this is what comes, what they're hearing. The time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is at hand. For this reason, repent and believe in the gospel. So I want to suggest to you that the first part of the invitation is repentance and belief. Repentance and belief. Now, can we just be honest for a minute? Some of us feel a little uncomfortable with that word of repentance, right? You know, Jesus loves me just as I am. I believe that. Do you believe that? I do. But maybe we're missing out on something that Jesus wants to do for us when we don't talk about repentance. Because Jesus loves you just as you are, but are you happy just as you are? 
Because if you are, you don't need a savior. So the first part of understanding Jesus' invitation is he's not calling you to stay where you're at. He's calling you to repent. And some of us, like I said, get a little uncomfortable because if you're like me, you're raised kind of with the same kind of churchy kind of talk that I was raised with. Repentance had to happen regularly for the same thing. You kind of wallowed in it, right? It was like, oh, Jesus, I'm really sorry. I did it again. I'm sorry I did it again. I'm sorry I did it again. And we spent a lot of time trying to pick out all the things we were doing wrong. And we were told, oh, you're doing this wrong. You're doing that wrong. You need to repent. And so it was kind of this constant looking at all the things I'm doing wrong and trying to get my, my act in order so that I was good enough to finally follow Jesus. Jesus, but can I suggest to you a different way of understanding repentance if you haven't understood it? Ronald Kurgan um, wrote a wonderful uh, commentary called the IVP New Testament Commentary on Mark, and this is the way he describes repentance. The fundamental meaning of repentance is to turn away from what we're doing and embrace what God is doing wholeheartedly. So you see, repentance isn't about what you're doing, it's about which way you're facing By the way, can I just tell you, if you're focused on all the things you're doing wrong, you can't really repent because you're facing them. You're not facing Jesus. You following me? You've got to repent. You've got to turn and face Jesus because you can't follow somebody you can't see. Bernie couldn't stand and face that way and know what I was doing up here. He had to come up here on the platform with me. Repentance is turning from what you think you want and need and saying, God, is that what you think I want and need? You know, my kids, my kids growing up, maybe some of you have kids like mine, they thought they needed a lot of sugar. (laughs) It's delicious. I love sugar too. But it'll make you sick if you eat too much of it. And as a loving parent, I'm like, that's not what's best. So do you trust that Jesus is a loving parent, that when he says repent, he's not trying to take away good things from you. He's trying to keep you away from things that will hurt you. So repentance, again, is not about wallowing in guilt. It's about changing the direction you are facing. Instead of facing towards Ken and what Ken wants, facing towards what Jesus is and wants and putting my eyes on him. By the way, if you're focused on all the things you're giving up, your eyes aren't focused on Jesus. It's an amazing thing how if you're following somebody, you can completely miss all the other things that are happening around you if your focus is there. So the question is today, as you're being invited to follow Jesus, is your attention on him or is it on other stuff? Sometimes it's good stuff. But the fact of the matter is Jesus needs you to shift your attention to him. And that's what repentance means. The other part of it is that belief. Is there anyone else who struggles to believe that God loves you where you're at? Is there anyone else who has struggled with that? To believe that where you're at right now, that Jesus could choose you to do something important. Or even unimportant. It's really important to understand that Jesus did something revolutionary as far as rabbis go. Rabbis in Jesus' day, they didn't pick their followers. They didn't go to where their followers were at and say, hey, come be my disciple. James Edwards in the gospel according to Mark says it this way, unlike the decisive call that comes from Jesus, entry into a rabbinical school so Jesus was, was acting as a rabbi. But in the, the regular rabbis, entry into their rabbinical school depended on the initiative of the aspiring student, not the call of the rabbi. Unlike rabbinic aspirants, the fishermen are not required to do anything before they become disciples. They need not exhibit knowledge of the Torah or pass a qualifying examination in theology. What they need to learn and do can only be learned and done as they follow Jesus. Those are beautiful words, my friends. 
Jesus doesn't call you once you've got your act together, once you've memorized enough scripture, once you've finally got that one sin that you've been struggling with for years and years, and when you finally conquered it. That's not when Jesus calls you. Jesus called you a long time ago. The Bible tells me that he called you before the world was even formed. You were chosen then. And the only question is, at what point are you ready to accept the invitation to change your direction and then to get behind Jesus and follow? We live in a world that spends a lot of time talking about leadership principles. And yet within the Christian church, there's only one thing that's really required, and that's to be a follower. Perhaps what this world needs is more followers and less delusional leaders. I'm a delusional leader too. I'm not picking on anybody. So the first thing we understand about this invitation is an invitation to change your direction, repent, and then believe that you've been called. Believe that there is a call there for you in your life. You have to believe it. Bernie had to believe that I really meant it. He might have hoped I didn't but he had to believe I meant it to come up front. The second part of that invitation is what Bernie did. It's the standing up and following. Not knowing for sure what that's going to look like and what that's going to mean. Can we talk a little bit about what it means to follow? And they left their nets at once and followed him. They left their nets at once and followed him. He called them at once, and they also followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. They followed him. So the first thing you need to know about following Jesus after that repentance and belief is that when you follow, you're going to have to leave something behind. Bernie had to leave his seat behind. He had to leave the comfort of not being seen or being paid attention to, which you're being paid attention to for the whole rest of the service, Bernie. He had to leave that behind and come up here. And following Jesus means you're going to have to leave some things behind. And that's not bad news, that's good news. How many of you would like to leave road rage behind? How many? I would too. I keep praying about that one. Orlando has not been helpful for me on that one. How many of you would like to leave hurt and pain behind? How many of you would like to leave behind the feeling of not having worth and find worth instead? But I want you to understand that when you leave even dysfunction, and some of you know how true these words are, even leaving dysfunction is painful. Because whatever your normal is, is what your normal is, even when it's incredibly dysfunctional. And so when you get up to follow Jesus, you can expect there to be a little bit of discomfort. It's not because Jesus is going to do bad things for you, just quite the contrary. He's going to do amazing things for you, but it's going to be a little uncomfortable. So you need to understand that following Jesus, once you get up and follow, you're going to have to leave some things behind. The good news is you don't have to worry about it because you're following Jesus. You're not following Ken, who's telling you to leave things behind. You're not, you're following Jesus. And do you understand that Jesus can ask different people to leave different things behind? Some of us need to be a little careful about this, don't we? We like to say, well, Jesus asked me to leave that behind, so you need to leave that behind too. Be careful. Be careful. I might need to lose some weight, but that might not be God's biggest problem that he's dealing with in my life. Maybe he's dealing with something else. And he says, Ken, let's put our focus all on this other thing. Then we can take care of something else. But somebody else is like, but health is what matters. Well, of course health matters. But not right now with what I'm going through and where Jesus is leading me. So we need to understand that What we're called to do is what Bernie did, imitate the person you're following. That means that if you're behind Jesus, you're not worried about who's on either side. You're just watching what Jesus is doing and doing it and trusting that he will lead you 
the way that you need to be led and not worrying about how he's leading everybody else around you. That's not to say that you don't worry about in introducing people to Jesus. It's not to say that you don't make a, you know, a couple suggestions here and there gracefully. But it's to say you're not Jesus. So Jesus can go ahead and lead. Okay? The final thing about that following part of the invitation is that following requires close proximity. Bernie could not follow me outside those doors. He can't see me. He doesn't know what I'm doing. Pretty excited. Kylie got her first car this week. And I'm also terrified. No, no clapping. I'm terrified. Just pr <laughs> prayers are all I want right now. She's a good driver. But Kyla had to drive that car back and follow me. And I didn't want her using the cell phone GPS this first drive. I wanted her just to follow me. In order for her to follow me, she had to be in close proximity. You know, the cool thing is that I slowed down when I saw her getting timid. I didn't go as fast as I normally would. And I want you to know that sometimes it feels like Jesus leaves you behind, but he never does. He never does. Just keep your eyes on him. He doesn't leave you behind, but you do need to stay in that proximity, and that's your choice. Family, if you want to be in close proximity with Jesus, you've got to spend some time with Jesus. I don't know how to say it any other way. It's not me being judgmental. It's not me being preaching. I'm just telling you, if you want to be fallen, you've got to spend time with Jesus. Now, I'm a preacher that's going to tell you there's a lot of different ways to spend time with Jesus. You know, traditionally, you say Bible study and prayer. You know, there's also music. There's nature. There's godly people. There's amazing books that have been written by incredible authors that have incredible insight into the character of God. There's a lot of times to connect with Jesus, ways to connect with Jesus. So how are you doing it? I'm not here to tell you how you should do it, how much time you should do it. I'm just here to say, do what you hear Jesus asking you to do to connect with him. But you've got to be in proximity with him. The final thing that I want you to understand about this invitation that you've been given is that it is not a, a solitary invitation. What do I mean by that? Jesus called out to them, come follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. They. You know, Jesus didn't just call one person. I don't think it's an accident. I think Mark really wanted to make the point. These disciples were called in twos. They became four. The invitation to follow Jesus is a community invitation. It's an invitation to come into community. Jesus invites us into a relationship with him so we can learn how to be in transformational relationship with the people of our community. You see, that's what that verse is saying. Jesus is saying, as I change you, you're going to change the environment around you because of the way you're following me. Jesus takes the tools that we were using for ourselves and not using very well for ourselves and transforms them into tools that build communities and heal communities. Is that how you're using the tools that have been given to you by Jesus? Because if you're following him, I know it's how you're using them. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, this is a passion topic for me. Why? Because there's a little churchy word that we like to use. Can I use a churchy word on you if I explain what it means? Is that okay? Discipleship. I just heard that a little bit. If you haven't heard it, it's okay. It's a churchy word. Can I just tell you that following Jesus equals discipleship. If you want to understand what discipleship is, all it is is following Jesus. That's it. It's following, that's, that's it. Nothing more, nothing less. It's following Jesus. Why is this such a passion topic for me? Well, many of you have heard my story from here and other places before, but this is what I used to do. I used to work in television news and I loved it. If you can't tell, I loved my job. And yes, that is a very old computer. <laughs> It was old when I was using it. <laughs> yeah, I used to work in news, and I love my job. And I heard Jesus say, Ken, 
I want you to leave this job and I want to use you and your storytelling skills differently. And I didn't like it, to be honest with you, because I was getting a lot of affirmation. I was doing a good job and I was getting a lot of affirmation. I could see the pathway to making a lot of money. And instead, Jesus said, I want you to go do public relations for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I said, no, please. (laughs) And I, but we listened and we did it. And can I just be honest with you? I hated it. I love the people I was working with, by the way, that they were wonderful people. But going from doing news to PR is like driving NASCAR and then driving Uber. Not the same thing. Not this, there's nothing wrong with driving Uber. I'm just saying it's a different pace. There's nothing wrong with being a PR professional. There's just what suits our personalities. And I like news and moving. Family. I'm passionate about it because I know for a fact God took me from the job that I thought I liked the most, but that I did go home at night feeling a little bit dirty because my wife liked to tease me that I was a professional gossip. But, but seriously, I, can I just tell you, like, for me, that was one of the hard parts of that job. That I, the one of the parts I didn't like was when I would report on people being arrested, but I wasn't sure they'd really done it. But I knew once I put their name on the air, it never would matter whether they did it or didn't do it. And that made me feel bad. But I had to do it because that was just part of the job. But I'm so glad that that kid... Listen to Jesus. Because I love what I do today. I went from the broadcast news to the good news. And I'm happy for that. Family, that's all I'm inviting you to do. Your, your call may not be as dramatic as mine, like a completely different career field. It might just be a shift of the way that you're working in your job. Maybe instead of thinking that you're there just to make money, maybe thinking that God put you there to meet people that need him. Maybe it's not even your job. Maybe it's the hobbies that you're doing. You thought you were out there getting some exercise or doing something, and God said, no, there's, there's people here that I want you to touch their lives. That's what it means to follow Jesus. It doesn't mean that you, you're not, Jesus doesn't necessarily ask everybody to change careers or anything like that. It's just simply doing what Jesus puts in front of you, that next step. That's it. So how do we hear Jesus calling us to follow him at Whole Life Church in 2023? Your staff has prayerfully thought about this. We've planned on this. We've gone to our church board. They've prayed on it. They've talked about it. And we've voted what we believe God's calling us to do this year. And I want to put it out there because the truth of the matter is it won't happen unless you're a part of it. Are you being called to help in one of these ways? I'm not here to tell you that you are. I'm just here to ask you. The first thing that we want to see is a 5% increase by the end of this year in attendance, not just at this service, but at everything we do. Small groups, justice ministry events, uh, you name it, our, our barn party, church retreat. Why? So that we can feel better about having five? No, because we believe that as more people come in, more lives are touched. That's it. If we're not growing, we're dying. So let's grow as Jesus leads us. And he'll lead us on how that looks. So we want you to feel really open if you feel like God puts it on your heart to invite your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anybody to come to anything that we're doing here at Whole Life. You never have to ask me, is this a good week to bring a visitor? It's always a good week to bring a guest to Whole Life Church. We will make a commitment not to embarrass you when you bring your friends here. And you don't have to ask. It is a good week. The next thing, as one of my mentors used to tell me, if it's not written, it's not real. So we're going to work this year on coming up with a written plan on how we do following Jesus, discipleship, at this church across all the ages, from birth Till you go to sleep in Jesus. Because we don't think you're finished with discipleship or following Jesus when you hit a certain age. We think that you follow Jesus till that last breath. And we want to have a plan for what that looks like. How we help you grow and stretch and be all that Jesus is calling you to be. And so that's why we want to have a written plan. 
The next thing that we're gonna do is you're gonna need some training resources. If Jesus is calling you, Jesus said, I'll show you how to fish for people. So we wanna come up with training resources for what Jesus is calling you to do. And we'll be doing that over the course of this year. Another really cool thing that's coming up is a single user virtual reality digital twin. That's a big mouthful, right? What is it? It's very simple. We believe that God has put a vision in front of us that virtual reality is the next World Wide Web. You remember how 25, 30 years ago, nobody knew what the World Wide Web was, and now everybody has it on their phone, which, by the way, you didn't get to carry with you 25, 30 years ago? We think that VR is going to be moving in that direction. So what we're doing is we're starting now, before we can see where we're going to land in creating a virtual reality digital twin. What that means is if you have a VR headset, you'll be able to feel like you physically walk into this room, into this church, and experience church. We're starting small and we're moving our way towards big things. But think about the implications of this. We have always considered ourselves to be the hospital church, right? The church that supports Advent Health and its mission. Think about what it would mean to patients and their families to be able to attend church from a hospital bed and feel like they're there, yeah? (laughs) Think about what it would feel like for all the people during the pandemic to actually be able to put on a headset and be encompassed. We hope to eventually get to the point where people can actually almost feel like they're physically worshiping with other people in the virtual world. So that's a a long-term plan for us, but in its reality this year, we're just launching this first small step where people will feel like they're in this room, they can watch services, and they'll feel like they're in a church and they'll have access to pastoral team and that sort of thing. So exciting stuff there. The next thing on our list is to create a dog park for our community. Have you noticed how many dogs walk around this or are being walked around this? We want them to do that, by the way. That's good. But as somebody who's owned dogs I can t- and in a small home, the worst thing on earth is to not be able to let them off their leash. And there's no safe place in this area for a dog to be let off to run. And so we want to create a dog park right over here where they can let their dogs off the leash and where we can be a blessing to our community in that way. The other part of that is that we want to take this area of the side of the church outside and turn it into, think about a European piazza, kind of town center area. I don't know how many of you have been to Europe. I've only been once. I was very fortunate to be able to do it that one time. But one of the things I thought was so cool is how many of the churches there are like the center of their town. And they have these amazing places that the tourists will come and sit. And then they'll walk through the churches. Wouldn't it be cool if we were the center of this area? that people in the apartments around here knew there was a really cool place. Wouldn't it be amazing to have like a little splash pad that kids can be splashing in on the warm days here in Florida? Wouldn't it be amazing to be that place where there was a maybe a a food truck or something that came here and that this became the center of community in our area? It's a big vision, but it's doable. And we can do that together. The final thing that we're going to have to do as we follow Jesus on this journey is we're going to have to grow our leadership teams. You know, I know that if you have grown up in the Seventh-day Adventist church, you think that whole life has a huge staff of people, right? If you didn't grow up in the Seventh-day Adventist church, you wonder how we're doing it. Because for a church of this size, we have a small staff compared to what most churches outside the Adventist denomination have. I want you to understand that we were going to rely on you as volunteers. It just simply will not happen with the people that we have as much as, as hard as they all work and they work hard. We're going to have to grow our leadership. And by the way, when I say our grow our leadership, we want to train you, not just simply to volunteer here, but to volunteer for the Red Cross and volunteer for another million other fabulous agencies that have no affiliation with us formally outside of the fact that we think they're great organizations. We want you to be the salt of the earth. We don't want you just to volunteer here. We wanna see you volunteering all over Orlando. And we'd love it if when people talk to you that you're like, wow, I've, tell us about you. Well, I go to Whole Life Church and, and one of the things that we talk about is being a good part of our community and making this place a better place, whether that's at, at the local Humane Society or whether it's wherever it is that you're there to help and be a part of that. So we're going to need to work on growing our leadership and our leadership teams, and we hope that you will not be afraid to hear God's call if he gives it to you to be a part of that leadership. 
some of you thought that last year that the theme was arise and you just thought it was random. It wasn't. It's part of a five-year plan. We know what our themes are for the next five years. Why? Because we're headed somewhere. The first step, I believe, is arising. I, don't believe, I believe that Peter, James, John, and Andrew had all met Jesus before he called them out on that beach. The book of John implies that, that, that they were disciples of John the Baptist, that they had seen Jesus be baptized. And so they had already arisen to who Jesus was. They checked him out. They'd heard John say he was the Messiah. And so when he called them, they, were, they, were, they, had, they had made some informed decisions and they made the choice. So last year, our call to you was, what is, is God working? Arise, time to wake up. What's going on? We're, we're coming out of COVID. Arise. And this year's call is, now that you've arisen, it's time to follow. Not asking you to follow Ken, asking you to follow Jesus on this journey. Next year's theme, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and tell you the next couple of years' themes. Next year's theme is connected. Why? Because I believe that Jesus leads us into connection. And so next year's theme is going to be all about connection with each other and the community around us. The following year's theme is overflow. I believe as we do that, that we're going to have a container that can't hold everything that God's doing in this church. And so we're going to have to ask God, how do you want to build that container bigger? Overflow. And then the final year, by the way, 2026, is this church's 100-year anniversary. And in 2026, one of the incredible things that Jesus said in the Gospels is that the disciples that came after him would do greater signs and wonders than he did. Think about that. God said, you will do bigger things than I did while I was here on earth. We think that the first year, 100 years of whole life's history have been amazing and God has done incredible things through this church. And we think that God is going to do even greater things. And in that year, we're going to talk about what God's calling us to. You guys ready to go? I'm ready to go too. So I'm just going to close with this one question. How will you arise this year? How will you arise and follow Jesus? How is Jesus calling you to follow him? There's some ideas out in the lobby and there's a lot more ideas that aren't in the lobby. But how is Jesus impressing you to follow him? I want you to go home today and talk to somebody that you care about and cares about you about how you think Jesus is calling you to follow this year. Hi, this is Randy McGray, podcast producer and host here at Whole Life Church. Loving people into a lifelong friendship with God is our mission at the Whole Life Church, and our podcasts are designed to help facilitate conversations that help us grow together in that pursuit. Now that you've heard the message for this week, don't forget to check out the Whole Life Takeaways for this message. Swipe up in today's show notes and join the conversation. Speaking of conversations, each Wednesday morning we take a closer look at the week's message. That's right, the one you just listened to. We discuss practical ways to apply spiritual lessons and ask honest questions about the issues we face as Christians, all focused through the lens of grace. Your voice is a welcomed addition to that conversation. We encourage your thoughts and your questions by sending a voicemail or text to 407 965 1607 or send an email to podcast at wholelife.church. You can find everything podcast related on our website, wholelife.church slash podcast. And plan on spending every Tuesday evening and Wednesday morning with us as we bring you the Whole Life Church inspiration you love straight into your headphones. Thanks for listening and have a great week.